My guest today is a great sportsman who plays great cricket, but many people believe he's often had to achieve his best against considerable odds. So has he sometimes been unlucky or has he sometimes been picked upon? Those are just two of many questions that I shall put to Nayan Mongia. Welcome to the program, Nayan. Thank you, sir. Your grandfather came across from Bhavalpur <coughs> to Baroda after independence and joined the railways. Your father's a businessman. How would you describe the family you come from? Yeah, after partition, my parents and my grandfather came to Baroda straight away and uh, they settled down. My grandfather was in railways and uh, my father used to work, once he finished his studies, he used to work in a surgical uh, business and then he started his own business in early 60s. So today would you say it's a business family? Uh, I think so. It's a business family from my father's side as well as from my mother's side. Now you were born into this family as the eldest child and also the first son. Would you say you were brought up strictly or were you spoiled? Uh, I was brought up very strictly. I was not allowed to do any mischief. What uh, we have, if, if we have only one son, like in a couple of families, they are all pampered. I was not that one. So there's a lot of discipline in your upbringing. Yeah, it is. You started cricket at the very early age of six, but in those days, it wasn't with a bat and ball that you played, was it? Yeah, I used to play with bat and ball, but I used to play with my lemon and all plastic balls and rubber balls. And sometimes you used to hit the ball so hard that you'd break the noses of people around you. Yeah, I still remember that was a very sad part of it. I broke somebody's nose and he was really badly injured and bleeding very, very hard. And uh, we took him to the hospital and uh, after that I was very careful while playing in a lane. We used to stay in a lane and uh, everybody ran and I was the one who picked him to somebody's house and then we treated, put some ice on it. And, so were you the local terror at the time? Everyone was scared of nine? Uh, not scared, you know, when I was used to come from the school and I called everybody from the whistle and they came down and uh, used to play cricket in our lane with the tennis ball or the rubble ball. Around that time, you first came to meet the Gaekwads when you joined their cricket academy. What sort of coaching lessons were those like? In Burro, there used to be summer camp uh, where Mr. D.K. Gaikwad, who is Anshuman Gaikwad's father, he was appointed uh, as an official coach there, only for summer camp. And then my parents put, put me there because I don't play in a lane and everybody said that you should put him there and they put me there in the summer camp. It was only for summer vacations but uh, as the year passed they started throughout the year, the Baroda Cricket Association started his own camp which was run by him and it was like throughout the year then they had a selection for that and then I was selected for the camp and I just uh, went there. Now in those early years you played for the Baroda under 12 team, you played also for the under 15 team. But it wasn't as a wicket keeper, was it? No, uh, when I was selected for under 12, I was a fast bowler. And uh, once our wicket keeper didn't turn, so I just started uh, keeping with my gloves and pads on. So it was an accident? It was an accident. And uh, Mr. D.K. Gaikar, who is my coach, saw me from behind and said, why don't you keep it? You have natural reflexes. So then onwards, I started keeping and enjoying it. You make it sound as if that accident hadn't happened. You might never have taken up wicket keeping. Probably I would have become an all-rounder, which India needs it. <laughs> <laughs> In those days, at the same time as all these developments happening on the cricket front, you were also technically going through school and then eventually college. Did your studies suffer as you concentrated on cricket? Yeah, it did. My, my mother especially said that uh, you have a business and uh, if you study and why don't you help your father once you finish your studies, there's no point of playing cricket and you know, not what are you going to achieve. But my father's friend who saw my progress, they persuaded uh, my father said, let him go, he has a bright future and the reports are good. So. My father and my father then continued with me that. Some of your college friends say that in fact even the teachers used to help you and apparently one of them on occasion was even prepared to let you cheat. Yeah, when I went to Australia for the 19 team and I was in the 10th standard and the 12th standard so I just arrived before the exams, you know, eve of the exams and I said this is the case so in certain questions he did help me. <laughs> and did you take up the offer? I did, yes. <laughs> did you regret it? Uh, no, not really yeah. because, you know, I studied there in the tour as well but, you know, I need to get past so. It was absolutely important. It was important. Now you made your debut in first class cricket when you played for Baroda and the Ranji Trophy and in the semi-finals against Delhi you even <coughs> scored a century. Was that a special moment for you? Yeah, when I, 1990 was my first year of uh, first class cricket, after 19 that was a big step and I was looking forward to it. I always think that when you play Ranji Trophy you should be age of 20, 22 and then you have enough time to mature and play for India for longer time. So at the right time I got the right break and uh, played that year and uh, in Indian team was going to England and they were looking for a second keeper. And we reached semi-final against Delhi and first inning we lost so there was no question we were going to reach final. 
So Mr. Anshuman Gaikwar was uh, my captain and he said, why don't you go up order? I said, okay, fine. And all the selectors were sitting and I got uh, say about 101 not out with all the top bowlers like Maninder, Sanjeev Sharma, Manoj was there, at Atul Vasan. And uh, I was picked as a second keeper for India in 1919, in England tour. Quite right, and you toured for a good three, four months with the Indian team, but were you upset that you never really got a chance to play in any of the tests in one days? Uh, not really till the last test match. I was very close to play the last test match and I did well in all the eight, nine games, whatever county games, and I was learning process for me. And I met Alan Nod. Bishan Bedi helped me a lot in that tour. He introduced to me Alan Nod, Bob Taylor, all the legend wicket keepers. I met them and they helped me a lot in my upbringing. In fact, in the county games on that tour, you were the highest scorer, weren't you? Yeah, I was. In the side matches, I scored properly all the games and kept well. And it was a learning process because in England, the ball wobbles a lot. So it was so important to learn so many things, the finer points of keeping. Sadly, on your return, your luck really nosedived and you went through perhaps the first of your bad patches in cricket. For three years, you were out of the team and you even lost your pace for a while in the West Zone side. What went wrong? Yeah, after that tour, and, you know, the, they said that you cannot have the same keepers from the same state, two wicket keepers from the same state, which I don't believe. And you have two bowlers, two fast batsmen, why can't you have two keepers if they are good? So I was dropped on that basis that you are not, uh, you are from the same state. So there are a lot of uh, options, there was a lot of uh, opinion that you should change the state and play for some other state so you get, don't miss that. But I never wanted to change my state. I always stick to my state uh, for Baroda and I played all the trial matches in the last that three years and performed. But it was three long years of not playing for India. You must have been very upset and frustrated. Did you ever consider giving up the game? Yeah, in 93, you know, early 93, my really, my parents said that after getting 400 in a row in Ranji Trophy, I was not picked for West Zone. And uh, an Indian team was going to tour Australia that year. And I was not picked for West Zone, so I said, there is no point now. I'm not picked for West Zone after 400, so I don't think I can ever make it for India. So I was just about to give it up, and uh, you know, my parents said that it's enough now. You can. My mother especially said, why don't you sit in a business? When you have ready made business, just look after your business. So what kept that. you going? I spoke to Mr. D.K. Gaikwad, I spoke to Anshuman Gaikwad, who was my captain Ranji Trophy. He said, you have age in your side, it's just a matter of time. Why don't you continue? And luckily I was picked for a Ryan Trophy that year, straight away. And I got 110 victims in that game. So it seems that the Gaikwads not only earlier in life were responsible for the coaching, but later on they were responsible for giving you confidence and reassurance. Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, both Mr. D.K. Gaikwad and Mr. Sancho Marenka really helped my career throughout yet, till today. It must have been a catch-22 situation because you knew that to get back in the team you have to play really well. And yet, given your emotional and psychological state, playing well must have been quite difficult. Yeah, it was difficult because I was always picked for all the trial matches. And, you know, in India, there's one chance you get it. You know, if, if it's like uh, if you do well in the first game, you are a hero. If you don't do well, it's very difficult to get another chance because the competition is so much. And luckily, I was doing well in all the games. And uh, I was picked for Iran Trophy. I got 110 catches. Again, there was a West on um, the Lip Trophy, that's four-day game. And uh, all the all the stop players were available. So again, I didn't play for West Zone for three matches. And luckily, the Kiran was not fit for the last game. And I was picked for the last game. And I got 80 and four victims. And then onwards, there was In a In fact, streamer. everyone remembers one particular game during that three-year fallow period where you did exceptionally well. I think it was the Irani match against Punjab when you took 10 catches and you scored over a century. Yeah. Now, was that luck? Or was that actually grit and determination and your belief that you're going to prove the selectors wrong? Both, I think you need luck with that also. If without luck, you can't do anything. But how much of it was simply your tough strength showing out? It was there, but without luck, as I said, without luck, you can't do You know, 50% you have grit and determination, and 50% of luck, I can say. So do you believe in luck? Uh, very much. And do you believe that, in fact, what went wrong during those three years was that your luck deserted you? Probably, yeah. Huh? It was a blessing in disguise because the three years, I learned a lot of things. Did you learn mental toughness? That was the main thing which I learned in that three years. Don't give it up. Just keep working hard. One day that chance will come and if you do well, you're on the right path. So alongside luck, the other important ingredient is be mentally tough. Tough. Yeah. Never give in. Exactly. Now, you eventually got to play for India when Sri Lanka toured in 93-94. Do you remember that first moment when you walked out in Lucknow to play for your country? Was it a thrilling moment or were you very, very nervous? I was very nervous because I was replacing who was the best keeper uh, that time and uh, you know to the stand to that expectation you know people will think that he has to be better than him. So there was always you know back of your mind there's a nervousness and you have to prove because you know that's the only chance you're going to get it. If you don't do well in a couple of matches you will never get it again. 
because of the competition and luckily I did well. Again, luck favoured me and... You had a terrific catch when you caught Roshan Mahanama, didn't you? You dived to the left and took it. Yeah, and I batted well also in quick 40s I made and we declared that inning. So at the end of that first match for India, that first test, did you say to yourself, I've made it? Or did you say to yourself, nope, there's lots more to go? Yeah, I never thought that I'll play for so long for India. I knew my parents, they just wanted to me see on the television for only once. You know, that we want to see you on television for only once. Everybody that was said, a real dream, that to was see a real, the child yeah. just once. Yeah, it was a black and, light, black and white doordarshan. The reception was not so good that time. So you can't recognize if you're not on the television. But after coming all these years, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can't believe that you've gone through all this thing. So Doordarshan's reception and broadcast was so bad, you said to yourself, I have to show it to my parents one more time. Properly. Exactly. Not one more time, probably not many times. Now let's take a break. I want to come back in part two and talk about all the amazing things you've done in the career that really began at that moment. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stick with us. Welcome back. My guest is Nayan Mongia. Now let's talk about some of the amazing milestones and achievements that you've had in your career. In 96 against the Australians in Delhi, you scored 152. Were you confident that day you were going to get a century? No, not really. Before the test match, uh, the selectors and they told me that you had to open the test match, uh, this uh, series. And there was only one test match and uh, they wanted to play five bowlers. So that combination was fitting and they told me in advance. So I was mentally and physically prepared for that and it was a winter time. So I didn't mind and, you know, one of the reporters told me just before the test match, uh, in the eve of the test match, that you're going to get 100. I said, if I get 100, I'll give you watch, wrist watch. He said, you can have to give me wrist watch. I said, okay, fair enough. And did you? And I gave it to him, yeah, after the test match. Not immediately, but one, when he met me again, I gave him a wrist watch. In fact, one of the most difficult things you had to do was you kept wickets the day before and then the next day you were opening. Is this com combination difficult to do, both wicket keeper and opening batsman? Yeah, especially when you're playing in subcontinent, it's uh, difficult because of the weather conditions and uh, you know, you're always on the stumps for say, about out of 90, 70 years you're on the stumps, so it leads to a lot of concentration and hard work. If you're standing back to the far it's much easier, but uh, especially you're keeping to the subcontinent, it's quite difficult, yes. Now, two years earlier in 94, when you were batting with Manoj Prabhakar, you got accused of playing slowly and scoring slowly. Do you remember when you got punished for it? What went wrong? Yeah, it was just all goof up and I think that's one of the worst uh, thing that happened in, in my career today, which I'm suffering till today for that. So were you targeted and picked upon? Uh, no, not really. Just everything you know, goofed up there and it just messed it up. It was a complete misunderstanding. Misunderstanding, yeah. Of course, most of your achievements have been as a wicket keeper. In the recent World Cup that's just finished, you got the catch for the best, you got the award for the best catch when you dived and you caught Azhar Mahmood. You had a fractured hand at the time. Was it very difficult? Uh, I didn't dive. It was uh, one of the difficult catch uh, of Azhar Mahmood with Kumlis bowling. It really jumped in the test hard. And uh, it was a crucial catch, a turning point of the game drop. We won that game because of that catch. We can see. But at the time when you had this catch in hand and you were obviously conscious that your hand was hurting, yeah. how did you make sure that you still took the catch? Because most people, when they're hurt, yeah, but once you're involved in the game, especially when Pakistan is playing, you know, you forget everything, what the injuries you have. You're always so much involved that you don't know what is happening. So I just, I don't know how it took it. It's just luck or whatever you call it. Now, one of the images one has of wicked keepers is them diving after the ball. In your case, when you dive, do you do it by instinct? Or do you also try and make sure that you have a good chance of success before you throw yourself at the ball? Yeah, make sure first that I can reach with the movement. I, have a lot, I believe in a lot of movements, you know. Diving is where you don't judge the ball properly, then you dive. And if you, if you have certain movement, after that movement you have to dive. You know, if you can't reach with the movement, then you have to dive. So I make sure that if I can move, I don't dive. It looks much neat and clean in the moment. And how diving. do you feel sometimes when you dive and you miss the catch? Does it upset and hurt you? Yeah, it does, but you're trying your best by that time. You know that diving is the last option you can do it. So, so it doesn't matter that you've missed it as long as you've tried hard exactly. enough. Yeah. Of course, the greatest achievement came during the 94-95 tour of New Zealand when you equaled the world record of five dismissals in a one-day game. But apparently no one realized it at the time that you'd done it. Yeah, in 94. 495 against New Zealand and that time the first time Tendulkar started opening when Sidhu had a stiff back and in that game only I took the five victims but it was all overshadowed by the brilliant batting by Tendulkar that time. 
But in fact, Ali Arani, who is the team physio, is the one who told you that you've just equaled a world record. Were you surprised? Yeah, I was very surprised because I also didn't realize that I took five victims. I was so much involved in the game and I didn't realize that I've taken five catches. But I still have that ball autographed with all the bowlers. And in fact, you've gone on to do this on two other occasions. You did it in Toronto and then you did it last year in Leicester during the World Cup. Yeah, myself and the West Indies, Radley Jacob, are the only th two keepers who have done thrice a five victims achievement. So I'm really proud of it. And yet, this sort of achievement of thrice e equaling a world record doesn't get the attention in the media that, say, a batsman scoring a century or a bowler taking five or six wickets. Do you think wicket keepers are taken for granted that sometimes their achievements are overlooked? Yeah, that's true because they said they have the gloves in your hand, they have to take everything, whatever it comes in your way. So I don't think it's correct, but it's a specialized job. I think, especially, in, you know, we have to work for the keepers here. Is it because the media doesn't and understand the role of a wicket keeper or is it because they don't think wicket keepers are as glamorous as batsmen and bowlers? Yeah, because in Western country they give a lot of importance to keeper as well. It's so important position in a team because you can everything look after from back and you can tell the bowlers and the batsmen what mistake they have done. And uh, you know, cricket is like batting and bowling. They don't say keeping as well. So I think I, you know we have to change that concept. So in a sense, this is an Indian prejudice against wicket keeping. Is that what you're suggesting? I think we are changing up. We have great keepers like Farooq, engineer Kirmani, and so many other keepers. But we're not changing fast enough. I think will come. Time will come for that. Now, after the World Cup, a very strange thing happened. You did extremely well at the recent World Cup, and yet mysteriously you got dropped from the. Sri Lankan series and the New Zealand series. What explanation did they give you? No, I was not dropped after the World Cup. I was injured in the World Cup and I had two factures in my hand when we had a bone scanning and CT scanning done in Baroda. So it took hell of a long time to recover. So in fact, the press suggestions that you've been dropped are in fact misreporting. Yeah, I think I was injured. I myself opted out because I was not fully fit till till the uh, Nairobi series. Okay, that's a very useful correction because, you know, another impression that's been in the news and repeated at great length in television shows is that during the Australia tour, the selectors, perhaps even the team management, treated you shabbily. Is that your own opinion of how you were treated? No, no, it's not really correct because I was told to go by the secretary of the board to the Australia because the keeper were injured and then after 20, 20 days, I think they told me to come back because he was fully fit. So I don't know what went wrong. But is it frustrating to be told to go, you go to Australia, you're ready to play, and then you find you're coming back without playing at all? Yeah, you can take it in your stride. It's part of your life. You learn so many things in the... Is this what you mean, that the whole secret of playing cricket is to be mentally tough, to yeah. not to let the politics upset you? Exactly. But when it happens so often, and you find it happening repeatedly, somewhere inside, presumably, there must be a sense of depression. Do you ever feel, oh, no, I'm going through it again? Yeah, you feel, but you have family backing you all the time, so I just take it in a stride because I have a long way to go. It's sometimes said that perhaps selectors, maybe captains, don't appreciate the role of wicket keepers. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, not really. They do appreciate now. Initially, I don't know, but now they have started appreciating that it's so important to have good keepers in the side. And also sometimes the press says that maybe Nayan has a problem with first Sachin and now perhaps more recently Saurav. Is there a politics in the team? That no, I don't think I have any problems with any Sachin or Sir or any of the teammates. I have no problems at all. So this is just a question of luck and it'll sort itself out? I think so. Huh? Do you feel today confident that you have a secure place in the team? Because again, some of the comments made are that Nayan is a great wicket keeper, but either luck or politics or circumstances always comes in the way. Do you feel you have a secure place? Yeah, still, uh, nobody's secure in the team. You have to perform all the time, probably. I may not be performing to the, up to the expectation what they're doing it, so I have to do better now to so, get back into the side. So every time you feel you're not chosen, this reinforces your determination to try harder. Yeah, that's the reason I'm not picked, I think so, because there's no other reason. OK, let's talk a little about your personal life. In 1996, you got married to your wife, Tanu. Where and how did you meet her? I was in office and... Uh, Tanu's parents and Tanu came to see me in Baroda. I don't know, my parents organized all this meeting. And they said, this is the girl. Was it an arranged marriage? It is proper arranged marriage. And did you immediately agree or did you take some time to make up your mind? Yeah, we went out for lunch. Both of family went out and the next day it was decided. In a couple of days it was decided that. Does she share your passion for cricket? Uh, the only thing that he didn't know, she didn't know anything about cricket initially. Absolutely she did, nothing. She didn't know what Nayan Monga is. <laughs> So once she got married to me and she came to know what cricket is. 
So the interesting thing is Nayan Mongya might have been a star to the world outside, but to the girl he married, he was no star at all. He was like a common man. Completely common. Completely. Is that in a sense a very important part of the relationship because you can now come home and you can relax and be yourself? Yeah, definitely, because she doesn't discuss anything about cricket with me. And so when you said earlier on that the family is the supporting element when things are going wrong in the world of cricket, did you mean in a sense that being married has also helped? Very helpful because you need a good family for that if you're not doing well or if you're going to a bad phase, family always support you. And now when you look to the future, how many years more do you give yourself as a cricketer? As long as I'm enjoying my cricket, as long as I'm performing, I'll keep playing. And it's there for your determination to continue until you can be of good use to the team? Very much. And then at that point? In five, six, seven, eight years, when you decide to give up, what will you do? I have not decided what I am going to do, but till now I am just concentrating on my cricket and I want to get back into the side. And so when you were young, your parents were very keen that you should get into the family business. Now when you give up cricket, will you fulfill that wish or are you going to look for some other thing to do? I think so my, my, especially my father who has, uh, has an established business since last about 35 years now. So probably I look after that. And this is in fact a business that you have been involved in even when you weren't playing cricket. So Very much. Uh, every afternoon I used to go there and leave my dad for lunch and when he comes back to the office I go back to my practice or my classes, whatever I have to. But I make sure that I'm there for two, three hours in the afternoon. Do you do really? it out of a sense of duty or do you do it in fact because in a, being a businessman is also another side of you? Yeah, you learn so many things. You meet so many people there in the business. You, mean, you learn so many arts. Very strange because they say you're a very shy, reserved, withdrawn person and yet you enjoy meeting different people at the business. I, you know, you learn so many things from the people, you know, you talk to them, you learn so many, how, the, how they behave, what the real life, that's a real life ultimately once you finish your cricket career, that's, that's going to be a real life. This is all probably, I think it's an artificial life, you're not going to stay glamorous or you're not going to stay, you know, you know play cricket throughout your career or till you are living. You're very conscious that being a cricket star, in a sense, is a sort of false life. You want to go back to the real life one day. Yeah, I think so. But do you, have you enjoyed being a star? Oh, yes, very much. That was the dream. That's the real, uh, you know, I work hard for that, to get in the glamorous life and to play cricket for India. So playing cricket for India has been a dream fulfilled? Very much, you know. I always wanted to play for India, so that has come true. Nain Mangya, for a wonderful interview. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Yeah.